Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you this morning. After the full cha chapel that we had on um, Thursday, it seems very quiet in here this morning. But Lord, we pray that as we're gathered as a, a smaller number this week, Lord, we pray that each one of us will really meet with you and know the power of your word speaking to us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Sam gets held up in traffic on the way, don't you, Sam? That horse bag just backed into the wall. No. Sam. Okay, let's start. Jean, who normally plays the piano, has sent a message to say she's not here this morning, so we've got Jan on the guitar all the way through. But we're going to start with this favourite hymn of, of Lynn's, and then we'll leave behind the subject of Lynn's funeral. But I, the Lord of Sea and Sky, I have to say, I've enjoyed singing this one, and it's got some lovely words in it, and as we get to know it better, we can focus on the words. So um, it's uh, the words... Well, up on the screen, if you want to use the book, it's 857. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Rosie's going to read to us now. Thank you, Rosie. The reading today comes from Nehemiah 8 and it's verses 1 to 12. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate, in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of law. Ezra the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion, Beside him, on his right side, stood Matea, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilika, and Messiah, and on his left were Pediah, Mishael, Malachi, Hashem, Hashbadaha, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shababiah, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalita, Azariah, Zozabad, Hanan, and Peliah, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people could understood what was being read. Then Neremiah, the governor, Ezra the priest and a teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Neremiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites carved all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink to send food portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. Thank you, Rosa. Well, 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 <laughs> so, um, we sang a song at the end of the service on, towards the end of the service on Sunday. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But um, Jan's now going to come and lead us in that song. Um, God of every grace. So um, for those who work here, this song was amazing really because it's, it's from Getty Music. It was actually written by Matt Papa and Matt Boswell who are part of the Getty Music group. Yeah? Um, and, but it came out, it was released the day after Lynn died and it just seemed to so fit with uh, the, the position. We sang it as a listening song at the uh, at the end of the message, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. But bit. people were saying, oh, that's one we can see in chapel, so we're going to learn it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, shall we try something down to start with, and then see how we have <coughs> Shines within this jar of clay. In affliction, you bring wisdom that my comforts can displace. How my true and 
greatest treasure is in you, the God of grace. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days, I sing through sorrow, sing with faith, oh praise the God of every Follow John. Uh, uh, I learned the harmony. He's got remember the tune. So uh, if you follow, if you follow John, that'll work better than trying to follow me. Okay. Let not this world of sorrows steal my only hope away. For the power of your gospel shines within this jar of clay. In affliction you bring wisdom that my comfort can displace. How my true and greatest treasure is in you, the God of grace. Now to the God of every grace Who counts my tears, who holds my days I sing through sorrow, sing with faith Oh, praise the God of every grace Hear me with the weight I can Give me wings of faith to rise For you know each grief that lingers Through the watches of the night Surely you have borne our sufferings At the cross took up our pain And you leave on to glory as we trust you God of grace now to the God of every grace who counts my tears who holds my days I sing through sorrows sing with faith oh praise the God of every grace There's a dawning hope before us That I know is soon to break As I wait upon your mercy Which will swallow every ache Cries of joy and songs of victory when we enter heaven's gates, all your children home together, all with you, the God of grace. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days, I sing through sorrows, Sing with faith, oh praise the God of every grace. The God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith, oh praise the God of every grace. Who counts my tears? I thought it said, "Who holds my face?" 
and it sounded really tender because in the previous verses it's talked about sorrows and grief and suffering and then at that moment God, like you do to a child yeah. when it's upset you need to and you cup its face and I imagine God doing that to me and now I realise he's holding my days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then if you see faith, Face people will think you're seeing faith. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one way or another, it will. Um, yes. Let me just. Um, it will, in a moment or two, we'll have a recap on on Nehemiah so far. So you can be having a think because I'm going to ask for contributions to the recap about Nehemiah. The other thing to say is, Bob. Um, Bob, it's communion today because we didn't have a service last week. We're having a communion a bit later. So um, if you want to. If you want to, I should have mentioned it earlier and then realised, but I'll do it now. But there will, there will be a song between now and then. Okay, I'll get a bottle of wine and a straw. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, we'll come in, in a moment, we'll come back to a recap on Nehemiah. But I wanted to share with you that um, after the service on Thursday, after the when we cleared up and there was loads of uh, sandwiches and things left over we were left with a challenge as, as to what to do with sandwiches so we took one to a family that we know um, find it hard to provide enough to eat and someone else took them home and said what am i going to do with all these and reported that they were all gone <laughs> in not very long <laughs> when they got them home to the family oh that was um amy wasn't it yeah uh, the week's daughter so when they got them back to their house they were all gone in no time and i'd already agreed with jackie at the pub that because there were some people going back there that i could take them to the pub i wasn't sure about that because of them doing food but she said oh no bring them down anyway so for no other reason but to take sandwiches we went to the pub but um, <laughs> but, 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 uh, on um, Thursday evening um, reasonably early anyway um, a lot of the sorry <laughs> oh it wasn't late well it was Still there when we came back. Yeah, no, no, no. We did stay and have a talk with a few people. Anyway, I'll tell you the story. So when we went in, and what was one of the things that was lovely about Lynn's service on Thursday was that how many of her children's friends were there. So people of about forty, yeah, who were who were there, and and that. Uh, a group of men, I say young men, but really men of that age, <laughs> were, were, age group, were, were in the pub after the service. And t t several of them came up to us and said how that song had moved them. And two of them said I was crying during the song. It just totally touched me and so on, which was quite amazing because we, we hadn't mentioned to anyone that we were going to sing it. And I just said, no, don't worry, we'll do it as part of the message. And it just felt completely right to do it. And um, anyway, one of them who was someone who, because uh, our oldest son is the same age as Amy, so someone who Ken had been at school with and they'd been good friends at primary school and then gone off to different secondary schools and we'd moved away from the village. He ended up talking to us at great, great length, didn't, didn't, didn't he, about... Yeah, and I was able to pray with him. him and connect him with a, a, he said I really need to find some, somewhere to, uh, and to connect him with a church in Bristol, yes, because he lives in Bristol, not because, it, yes, which, um, which is why a church in Bristol, but um, it was just um, but lovely, but the other thing that had happened, that this person, same person had had a horrible experience of finding somebody realising that somewhere where he'd been mowing the grass had been uh, the person who'd lived there he hadn't seen and went and tried to knock him up and he wasn't there and eventually he called the police and uh, it turned out he'd been dead inside for nearly two weeks so uh, uh, he, he had to identify him and, and everything he was the only one and the police had him down as the next of king because they couldn't trace anybody else who was connected and he told us about this and described where the person lived. And we remembered that f several years ago, uh, we'd had a reunion with Jan's university friends. 
and one of the people who who was in a flat, shared a flat with Jan while she was at university, mentioned going to visit a relative who lived at that address. And uh, we connected the dots, and, and actually the police had managed to contact them and discovered that the day before, and they'd heard that he'd been... It's just incredible. Yeah, and uh, anyway, they were going to talk to each other, the family and, he, and uh, the chap involved were going to talk to each other. But this was someone who shared a flat at Newcastle University um, 40 something years ago. <laughs> More nearer 50, really, isn't it, than 40 years ago? Yeah, well, it was a dis- <laughs> Yeah. So it was just, a, it just felt like there was something quite um, just sort of God at work in, in, in things that, that happened after the service. God at work. So talking about God at work, um, before we, we took an interlude over the last three or four weeks, we've been looking at the book of Nehemiah. So let's have some attempts, shall we, at summarising uh, what's happened so far in the book of Nehemiah. It's quite a good story. It's, uh, it's a great story. Anyone to start? So what's the background? The background is that the people of Israel have been in exile in um, in. Babylon for some time and some of them have been allowed to go back and have started trying to rebuild there but the walls are still all broken down and Nehemiah, it, shall I just carry on? Yeah. Nehemiah's working, working for the king. He's working for the king. And he cooked there. There's a cupbearer. Yeah. And he wanted to go, he felt God was calling him to go back and organise the yeah. rebuilding Right, so they started to rebuild, and everybody, it was something, everybody in th- there had a job to do. So everybody was, each family, uh, and including the priests, and everybody were responsible for a section of the wall. And as they started to rebuild the wall, what happened? People, some people came from somewhere else and said that they couldn't, um, they didn't think they could do that. They couldn't do Ridiculed them, didn't they? Ridiculed them. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Made fun of them and said it was impossible and they never would do it. Yeah. Mm. And then they got halfway through building the walls and so the ridicule stopped and then what happened? They finished it and had dinner. Sorry? They finished it and had dinner. No, 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 there's the other things that happened before they finished it and had dinner. They don't get, we've not got to the dinner bit, that's today. Oh. Yeah, it is. So, so there we go. But it does end with dinner, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so then they st- when taking the mick didn't uh, work, they then started attacking them, yeah, yeah, to stop them completing the work of building the walls. And so Nehemiah divided them into two groups, really, and set half the people to be a defence force and half the people to build the wall. And he had somebody with a bugle that if anywhere was attacked, then they would all gather on that place to help defend, yeah? <coughs> Thank you. Why? <laughs> this is really good. Yes, I think. Um, what, why didn't they want them to build it? Was why it didn't they want them to build it? A, a demonstration of God, and they yeah. didn't want that. Yeah, I mean, it was a demonstration of re-establishing this city of Jerusalem, which was the place with the temple, and has, was kind of the earthly symbol of God's power on earth that had been destroyed and was now being rebuilt. So it was very significant from that point of view. And one of the sort of things that we took from it was the way in which, two two things really, one, that everybody had a job and there was a sense in which everybody had a responsibility for their part of the wall and what a good model that is for church. And then when it came to saying, but then he ended up dividing between people who were going to defend and people who were going to be doing the work. That for me, there's a parallel there that there need to be people whose main focus is 
praying, there will, there will be practical people who, who get on and do things, and there will be other people whose main focus is praying. Yeah? And those two things are necessary for things to get done. You need the pr- not that everybody shouldn't pray and not that everybody shouldn't do something, but the balance in different people's lives will be different. And one of the lovely things I think is that, um, you know, as we get older, we may not be able to do all the practical things that we used to do, but we can still do the praying, yeah? And um, no, we don't get too old to be able to do the praying and people can pray right up to the end of their lives and indeed they do. And um, we often think back to the story of the Hebrides revival when there was a mighty move of, uh, of God on the Hebrides where people turned to God in huge numbers. People who were just going about doing their normal business were stopped and found themselves worshipping God. And um, this Hebrides revival, everyone said it was prayed in by two old ladies, one of whom was blind. Yeah, uh, and uh, they kept, they believed God, it wasn't just their idea, they believed God wanted to do something new in the Hebrides. This was in the, the 1940s, wasn't it? So we're, not, we're talking about possibly even in some, not, no, I'll be careful. <laughs> not long before most of our lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> that this happened, that this happened, and you know, there was a profound move of the Holy Spirit that affected a whole community. And so, um, they were they completed the work in 52 days. It says they completed the work of building the wall. And now we get to the reading that Rosie read to us, which was. Um, <laughs> So when they'd finished it effectively, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So because Jerusalem had really been suspended, the reading of the law and all of those things hadn't been happening. And now, because we'd now got it re-established with, the, with, with people back there, they said, come on, let's get back to what we're supposed to do, which is bring it out. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. Some might have brought their dogs and cats along, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but no, all who were able to understand, so presumably older children and so on, who were able to understand what was being read. And... Um, he read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate. So sometimes we're choosing um, Bible readings in church and sometimes I think about what I want to preach on and I come up with a Bible reading and you think to get the whole context it's 27 verses. Uh, we can't really have 27 verses because people will stop listening and so you kind of miss out a bit in the middle so that you can uh, you can do it and so on because 27 verses seems a little past the threshold for a reading well clearly they had a different view because Ezra read out the law so he read aloud from the scriptures that would have been on a scroll reading them whichever way he read them um, it, at the water gate and he read them from daybreak until noon. So that's a six hour Bible reading. So um, if you want a good introduction to our service, six hours of Bible reading before we started. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And I think people of our age are often rude about um, chill, younger people struggling with lack of attention and not being able to pay attention for long enough. I have to say, it may be the case that the next generation are less good at it than we are, but we're less good at it than people were generations before us, because we've been brought up on television and all kinds of visual stimulation in order to keep our, our, us focused. And just sitting and listening for hours is not something, well, it's certainly not something that I'm good at, and I don't I don't think it's something that most people 
who are alive today uh, are good at. And um, you look at sort of earlier civilizations, and people could listen and they would remember, and stories got retold. And you think of like folk music, so, um, folk music would someone would hear it and then they'd sing it again. And obviously, when they sang it again, they sang it a bit different, hence, you ended up with different versions of songs. And it was interesting with Christian music when lots of new spontaneous songs started coming out um, sort of 60, 60 years ago or so with, the, with charismatic renewal and there were lots of new spontaneous songs. Exactly the same thing happened. People went to a meeting, learnt it, took it back to their church and taught it and there were lots of versions and everywhere you went they sang a different version. These days, the songs tend to come out on YouTube and everyone has a definitive version that they learn from. So people learn it the same and try to sing it the way it was sung on YouTube. Whereas, um, you know, it, it, the, the oral tradition was still alive and well uh, and is still alive and well in parts of the world where people don't have the same access to technology. But they listened attentively to the book of the law. And Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high platform built for the occasion. And beside him, uh, on his right, were all these people with difficult names. And on his left were another set of people with difficult names. And I haven't been able to find any great significance about who the people were and what, what their names were. But I didn't tell Rosie that before she struggled through the list. <laughs> so um, I'm going to avoid having to say them all. But he's surrounded by people who are obviously somehow part of his team. And that he's got people who are close to him. Now what you see in this is he's got two roles, which is unusual. Ezra is both a teacher of the law or a scribe, they were the same things, and the teachers of the law would be the same people who rewrote out the scriptures. You know when in the New Testament with Jesus he talks about the scribes and the Pharisees? Well if you think that every copy of the scrolls had to be written out by hand, so before people could have a copy to read in their synagogue, someone else had to have written it out, then the, the job of the scribe was a very trusted job to be the person who would read through the old scrolls and write out a copy of the scrolls. And inevitably, somewhere along the line, there would sometimes be little mistakes and different changes would creep in. And when they look at, find, when they find old scrolls, they look for what are the similarities and where, where are their differences and so on. But um, so Ezra was a, a, a teacher of the law and a scribe, and he was also a priest. So as a priest, he was responsible for the um, sacrificial role. And I expect that these roles have become compressed because of exile, that it, because um, the full splendor of what could happen, you know what happens in any organization when you get cut down and circumstances aren't ideal, you combine more than one job into one person, Don't, isn't it? That's what happens, you know, you end up with more than one job. And in the circumstances of being taken into exile and everything, um, all Ezra had kind of ended up becoming the spiritual authority, both as a priest and as a scribe. And I think, though I can't back it up, that the people here were people who were his kind of trainee group, his mentees as scribes, and a little bit later on we see about the Levites and the people joining him then would be the people who were the priests beneath him, so that he'd almost got a team of both. I think that's the case, but I can't really demonstrate to you from the scripture that that's the case. But he stood on a high platform so that they could see him, so they did everything practical that they could to make sure he was heard and understood. And he spoke, he opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them and he opened it and the people all stood up. So not only did they listen, but they stood and listened. And um, when I was um, younger, I used to go and watch football and it was always standing. I couldn't afford a seat. And in any case, it always seemed boring standing. And we never thought anything really of standing. We'd get there early and stand and things. We never thought anything of it. I have to say, uh, standing up all match now isn't so appealing. But um, yeah, and, but, and then it says, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And some of you may recall, I've mentioned before, whenever 
people worship in scripture it's quite remarkable there's always some physical response along with it they don't just say amen amen they lifted up their hands and said amen amen and there's something more dynamic and more i really mean this about putting my whole body into it than just using our mouth isn't there and um, you know although sometimes we think of action songs as being for children actually when we get when we teach the children action songs at the club it does get us into the meaning of the song doesn't it yeah and it gets you expressing it more using your body and um, they shouted amen amen and then they worshiped their lord the lord with their faces to the ground so then they fell on the ground and worshiped the lord with their faces to the ground people never just sat around and uh, and worshiped and then it says the levites um, so this is um, the, the Levites are the people in the priestly line so the priests came from the tri tribe of Levi and then a long list of names that Rosie read so well for us instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there and so somehow after the law had been read you imagine that the Levites were mingling with them and talking to them and helping them understand what had been read and um, the whole job of, of reading and helping to understand is a pattern that we try to follow in church every Sunday. I'm always amazed. I, well, I often go to, well, I don't very often go to church services elsewhere because I'm always here. But um, when I do go to church services elsewhere, I'm quite surprised that often you go and they have a scripture reading and then somebody stands up and preaches and preaches about nothing to do with what they read from the Bible this morning and just kind of gives their opinion on things that are going on in the world. And um, for me, it's always been important that the preaching spot is about expanding the scripture that you've read. And I was only thinking this week, early in Jan's and my um, Christian life, when we came back to the Lord, we went to Spring Harvest with a group from Yelvertoft. And for those who don't know what Spring Harvest is, it's still going. Um, and it's a kind of Christian camp. It was at Butlins. It, was it in Minehead or Skeggy? It was in Skegness we went. It, I don't think it is at Skeggy still. It's at, at Minehead now. But it, it, it was at Butlins. And there was thousands of Christians went there. And we stayed. We had a very nice chalet, actually. It was, it was much better than I expected Butlins to be, having never been to a Butlins before then. And um, there were big meetings in a big top. And then at different times, there were various event facilities in Butlins. At different times, there were breakout sessions. And we went each morning to the Bible reading session and um, the person conducting those was someone called R.T. Kendall, who's an American um, who at that time was the, the pastor at Westminster Chapel in, um, in London which is an evangelical congregational church. For, but um, so West, Westminster Chapel, he was there and he was... He'd followed someone called Martin Lloyd-Jones, often known as The Doctor. And uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a famous book, the Joy Unspeakable. Joy Unspeakable, which was about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit, which was radical in the context of evangelical con congregational churches. They didn't really believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he'd written this book. And um, R.T. Kendall followed him to, to Westminster Chapel later and uh, always considered that he was treading in big footsteps. And R.T. Kendall was well known uh, as an American pastor before that. And he did these things and we were just so enraptured, weren't we? He, he, he spoke from the book of Daniel all week and he read the passage and talked about it and explained it and explained the background. And we were just kind of captivated by listening to his teaching. And it wasn't kind of um, flashy in any way. It was just, here's the scripture. This is what was going on. 
this is what happened and and so on and um, I have to say it for me it provided a sort of role model that I've sought to follow I'm sure I don't do it anywhere near as well as he did but it was the role model for for a style of preaching that I just felt when I started to preach that was the role model that I had um, was that week spent listening to to RT Kendall and we sometimes listen to his messages on YouTube now he's quite old now he wasn't that young then and um, he's quite a lot older than us which makes him quite old <laughs> um, but um, anyway he's still going strong preaching in the States but they so they explained an, an, the meaning of the scripture and then they read for they read from the book so it's just recapping really that together they read from the book of the law of God making it clear and making sure people understood what was being read and then when they've be, uh, done this and they've heard from the law then Nehemiah the governor Ezra the priest and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing them said this day is holy to the Lord do not mourn or weep for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the Lord. So, say, so they've been crying. The, the emotion, I imagine, of hearing the law, of the, the law, the scriptures preached again, and the conviction that as they're hearing the, the scriptures preached, the Holy Spirit convicting them, they've not listened to God's ways for ages. They didn't have the option, like we do, of sitting at home reading their own Bible. That wasn't something that anybody would have had at home. They didn't have the option, like we do, of low up the Bible on their phone and listening to it in the car as they're driving along. They didn't have the option of going and listening to sermons on YouTube. When none of this stuff was happening in a corporate way, then they had none of this as input. Yeah? And now, after all these years, they're back in Jerusalem hearing that God's word being read out. And as they're hearing God's word read out, his Holy Spirit is moving in them and no doubt convicting them of sin and causing them to, to weep both with repentance and um, with emotion. But uh, Nehemiah says to them alongside Ezra, don't mourn or weep, this day is holy to the Lord your God. So what are we going to do on this day that's holy? Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drink and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This daily is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that from this place when they're hearing the word preached and, uh, and they're weeping and they're weeping emotionally, weeping from conviction of sin, uh, they're told this is a holy day enjoy it oh isn't that a wonderful message this is a holy day enjoy it I don't know when you think of what people learnt about it's a, ho it's a holy day you've got to be miserable <laughs> it's almost the way we people, oh you mustn't do this or you mustn't do that it's a holy day but actually Nehemiah's message to them this is a holy day go and get some good food and some good drink and um, it would have been alcoholic good drink um, go and get them and enjoy it and for those who haven't got anything take it to them and make sure that they've got something and that this is a day that we're going to enjoy together and um, you know in the context of conversations that we've been having about how do we help people locally who may not have enough to eat um, we don't know the mechanism but the idea of taking stuff to people who don't have enough is, is right here in this scripture and the Levites calmed all the people because we get the feeling they're moving among them saying be still for this is a holy day do not grieve and then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been spoken. I've missed off the being spoken off the screen. And I just love that sense that at the end of building the wall, 
building the wall, coming together and hearing the word of God preached. But in that, there's a repentance. Oh, we've got this so much. We've got so much we've got wrong. We're hearing it for the first time. And gosh, we haven't done this and we haven't done that. And they're weeping away. And um, then the message they get is, it's a holy day. And it's a holy day. God has spoken to you. God doesn't speak to us to make us feel miserable. He speaks to us to set us free. Repentance is real. Yeah, Repentance is a gift. You know, you sometimes hear people, you must repent. And I think, no, it's a wonderful gift is repentance. The ability to turn back from things that we're, we've done wrong. And to turn away from them and say, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm free from doing that. I don't have to do that anymore. And now I'm celebrating, I'm celebrating forgiveness. I can enjoy it. Yeah, It's a gift of repentance. And... Um, They'd, they'd, they'd come to that place and they were told, go away and eat and enjoy good food and enjoy and let's celebrate this day. And so we have the culmination of the building of the wall and the reading and teaching of the word again. And it culminates in people going off and having a, a good feast and saying, this is a holy day. We're going to celebrate God's goodness to us. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And um, there's a lovely song, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength and Shield. And I know Christians in really difficult circumstances, and they will come back to, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. There's all sorts of stuff that might be happening out there that might make me miserable. But deep inside, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. And, um, you know, that's something that I pray that we might each know that whatever's going on, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So as we come on to take communion, let's prepare for that. And I would just say that anyone who um, acknowledges the Lord Jesus as their saviour is welcome to join us in communion. Um, as we go on from that, let's prepare for that with this simple confession. Dear Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. I know that my thoughts, words and actions fall short of your perfection and that I don't allow you to be Lord of all my life. As I partake of communion today, I thank you for your forgiveness, bought with your precious blood shed for me please fill me with your holy spirit to enable me to live a life that brings glory to you we ask this in jesus name amen and shall we sing how deep the father's love for us I hear my mocking 
And um, those words speak about the fact that actually the church, us, being gathered, being brought into relationship with him. We're here on earth, but at, at the end of time, taken up to be the bride of Christ. That's Christ's reward for, his, for, for what he went through for us. And that uh, he went for it for the joy, he went through the cross for the joy that have set, was set before him. And the joy that was set before him was being reunited with his people. That it brought deep joy. And he went through the cross for that. And so the question, why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer that we all gain because he, that God, the Father is giving to him the church as his bride. And we're wrapped up in that. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Bob shared something with me um, yesterday, actually, and uh, it was a uh, speaker saying, just in summary, if you would get to get to the pearly gates and you're giving account of why it is you should be let in, if any account that you might give begins, well, I did this, I did that, or I whatever, then you got it wrong. Yeah. Actually, the only reason and justification we can give why the Lord might admit us into heaven is because Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for me, and I place my trust in that. And as we take communion, that's so much an expression of, of that. Shall we have the elements out? And um, we'll do what... Do you, are you doing, are you happy to pass it round? Is that all right? You're doing everything this morning, John. So if we if we take if we take the bread and um, and hang on to it for the moment, and then um, when we've all got it, we'll break it. But I want to do something. To, and of course, the bread represents the body of Christ. But when when you've got your piece of bread your breadstick in this case perhaps this will be difficult for Bob to emulate but for the rest of us here let's in a moment or two I'll pray giving thanks for the the bread the body of Christ let's each break it and then give half of our bread to the person on our right just to keep it simple that's that side <laughs> Put mine to my mouth. <laughs> 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 I'm anticipating what's happening. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay if I call Billy in? <laughs> what did he say? Billy, the dog. The dog. <laughs> yeah, you can give half to Billy if you want. No, let's not. Thank you. Sorry. 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 Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us. And as we eat this bread this morning, we remember your body broken for us. And we remember that we are part of your body here on earth. We remember that on the cross, Jesus' blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Would anyone like to give thanks for the blood shed for us? the cup round and when we've got it let's just hang on to it until we've all got it and can drink at the same time thank you Jan how is this bringing it thank you This is my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Where your majesty is shown. 
alone. Where the crown of my life I lay down. Draw me close to your side, where my heart is satisfied. Draw me close to you, Lord. Draw me close. Draw me close to the cross, to the place of your love, to the place where you pour out your mercy. The river of life that flows from your wounded side brings refreshing to those who draw near. Draw me close to your throne where your majesty is shown. Where the crown of my life I lay down. Draw me close to your side, where my heart is satisfied. Draw me close to you, Lord. Lord, as we pray for that prayer for ourselves, Lord, draw me close to you, draw me close to your cross. Lord, we pray that for others as well. Lord, I pray for Mick and for the rest of Lynn's family. Lord, I pray that you will draw them close to you and that they will know the, the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And Lord, I pray for Jean as she's at home uh, today, not well. Lord, that uh, although she's not able to be with us physically, that she will know your strength, that you will indeed draw her close to your cross, the place of refreshing that flows from your side. And Lord, I pray for Marjorie's family as they're preparing for her funeral, Lord. I pray that you will be with them. And Lord, whether they acknowledge you or not, that they will uh, be uplifted by you. And Lord, I pray for leaders in the world, that you would draw them play close to the place of the cross. To the place where you, the creator of everything, laid down yourselves completely for us, Lord. And Lord, we pray that your example of servant sacrificial leadership might become an example that leaders in the world might follow because they recognise your cross. And Lord, we know that if that were the case, the world would be a, di a different place. So Lord, we pray that you would draw people of authority to your cross, to your side, that they might know the joy and freedom of repentance, of changing the way they think, the way they do things. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment. Um, we can pray silently about things, and if anybody else wants to pray out loud, please do so, but with a loud voice so we can all hear. Doreen up to you Lord today as she's suffering with the heat and didn't feel up to walking up. She's asked a prayer for her granddaughter Madeline who as she said is working flat out as a paramedic with the West Midlands ambulances. And lift her to you Lord and she knows that you're near and that you will help her day to day as she deals 
in difficult circumstances, in all sorts of situations. And we pray for everyone in a this, in this similar line of work, that you too will guide them and strengthen them. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, there's a prize, a very small prize for those who spot the deliberate mistake. Um, but, um, Yes, yeah, so we've got coffee after the service. If Please do stay. If anyone would like prayer at any time, please ask over coffee. That's fine. Um, it says our next church meeting is on the 4th of September. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, we don't have a time machine. It's next, the next one's on the 2nd of October. That's our members' uh, business meeting. Um, we should be able to have the Bible study this week at 2.30. It's also chat this week, but we've got the Bible study this week at 2.30. And then next Sunday, we're sort of back to usual here at 10.45 and on Zoom. Um, the family day on October the 7th, that's, the date is now confirmed. So, um, yeah, so that's the 7th of October. Um, and the school are happy for Youth for Christ to do one of our assemblies. Yes, so uh, hopefully that'll help. But we'll have to, this week, focus on what we're doing publicity-wise. Um, we haven't really thought about that um, in due to other things over the last couple of weeks. So that's on the 7th of October at the Village Hall. Okay, is there anything else that any... It's a Saturday. Yes, yes. Just Sorry? This coming Saturday is the village fate, yes. This coming Saturday is the village. 12 o'clock. Yes, it starts at 12 o'clock. And, um, yes, it's so, that sort of time. Is that, I, I know I'm setting up PA stuff in the morning and singing for a bit in the afternoon. So, yeah, but there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's a taste of the Oktoberfest stuff. <laughs> it, um, uh, yeah, you remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's, that'll be on the 29th of... So anyway, that's not a church notice. Let me... <laughs> let me not mix. Yeah, so let's um, sing our, our last hymn, which is, O Church, Arise and Put Your Armour On.